Um, OK, so I'm going to do a quick presentation on some Ethereum JavaScript stuff. Um, and can you guys hear me OK? Is everything good? All right, cool. So um, it's going to be on some alternatives uh, that are available in the ecosystem that you may not be aware of. And I think um, it should open you up to kind of the possibilities uh, on the RPC layer and, um, and kind of how you want to approach designing your, your app or dApp. So right now, the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, especially on the RPC layer, is kind of dominated by these modules, Web3, Ethereum JS, Parity API, Ethers JS, which was just recently released, uh, and ETH JS, uh, which has kind of been in the background for a little while. Um, so to go through a bit of an overview, um, ETHJS is a small organization um, that has a, a few modules, 15 in total. Um, and we have one boilerplate and a few development tools, so some command line stuff as well. Um, everything's fully documented. Everything's fully exemplified um, and MIT licensed. Um, it's production ready, although there's uh, one module that you probably shouldn't use because it's not EIP-155, so Richard tells me. <laughs> and 100% um, uh, test coverage and 98% build up time as a general policy. So um, this is kind of uh, the organization as a whole. Um, and uh, it's, it's on GitHub, so just github.com slash ethjs. Uh, and we have about 20 repositories. So initially, a few months ago, um, I had gotten a little frustrated with Web3. Um, and um, I had also been working and talking with Richard Moore on a few different points. And um, kind of uh, wrote a different approach to Web3, so, um, and also a little different approach to how Ethers.js was doing it at the time. Um, and uh, I definitely encourage you to check out all the alternatives and kind of um, make a decision for what's right uh, if you do want to use an alternative to Web3. Um, and um, so uh, basically, th there's a few different philosophies and things in, uh, to keep in mind. So EJS can be used as an alternative to Web3, but I actually like it to be used more for architecture. Um, it's used in quite a few projects I'll, I'll go over in a bit. Um, I think diversity in modules and libraries kind of makes the community stronger. I think um, you know having different options and different opinions and different ways to, to interact with Ethereum is kind of critical to building a stronger community and stronger infrastructure. Um, companion libraries help influence each other's design. So some of ETHJS kind of helped Web3 1.0. Uh, Ethers.js helped me uh, build some ETHJS stuff. So, um, and in fact, I use some of, some of their modules in, uh, in my libraries. Um, and uh, of course, we still follow all the RPC specifications and the provider models that people are used to. Um, but uh, we kind of have different opinions on approaching how to interact with it. Um, and um, so the way that I've kind of constructed ETHJS, at least the, the core interface there, is uh, you have your contract module, filtering modules, and so forth. This has become kind of a standard practice now. Um, I have my querying layer, which combines both uh, an RPC module and a formatting module, um, and basically formats all your input inputs and outputs to the RPC layer automatically. Um, and ETHJS schema is actually, I think, one of the, the better things that I definitely did here. So I just laid out in a JSON file the entire RPC specification and all the inputs and outputs. So you can basically take that and auto-generate um, the entire RPC query layer um, and, uh, and have that an automated process. So this has kept it to be very you know, easy process for me to update or for others to come along and, and add mo methods and so forth. It really is uh, all automatic. Um, and uh, so just a little more in depth on some of the modules. Here's some providers uh, for signing, HTTP querying, um, some unit handling, formatting, um, event filtering, contract handling, transaction signing, although definitely just use ethers for that because EIP 155. And uh, uh, accounts, so just generating and managing accounts, although you have to be very careful because you do have to supply your own good sources of entropy. And while I do supply some sources of entropy with random bytes, which is known to be safe, 
it's basically you want to bring a lot of entropy to the table that's very healthy. Um, and some util modules and some ENS resolving modules. Um, so here's the schema that I was talking about. So this just lays out the entire RPC specification in a very data lean format. I'm not going to say it's particularly standardized, but uh, it essentially lays out all the inputs and outputs. So if you want to take this and go into you know, Objective-C, or if you want to take this and go into another language and build an RPC layer for Ethereum, you can just take this JSON and automatically generate the whole thing. Um, so, and I actually encourage people as well, one thing that I've found with doing a lot of these modules is it's helped people learn more about what the RPC layer is and what it's actually doing, because it's really simple. Like, what Web3's job is, or Ethers, or ETHJS, uh, is basically just to help you interact with the node on the RPC layer and format some data, and that's it. And it, it's a very straightforward process. Um, number handling and these other things are, uh, is well, something that should be simple, but um, it turned out to be a little complicated for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so here's just uh, ETHJS kind of in action. Um, it looks very similar to Web3. And I follow a very similar format to Web3, um, and uh, other, other libraries don't necessarily. Um, so uh, just, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, so the modules are all designed with the same kind of documentation and standards in mind around testing and so forth, um, and try to make the exports clean and simple and easy to update and upgrade. Um, so basically, like, you know, I, I wanted to build a set of modules that the community could help out with. And if anything, just learn about the layer and also if they need things for certain architecture pieces, they can use these modules. So ETHJS is used in production uh, for MetaMask and Fiora and Truffle, mainly for certain bits of encoding and decoding and RPC layer stuff. Um, and uh, just to go over a little bit of the thinking behind uh, how it's developed. So I, I like safe versioning where, well, I call it safe versioning, where you don't have floating NPM versions across the modules. Just because I found that when modules update the NPM versions, they shove up to the top and then potentially cause problems that you can't foresee. So I like to use hardened versions across NPM uh, and just kind of keep the updating um, kind of slow and boring, but more meticulous and more tested. Um, all the modules are, are driven by what their dependencies are. So there's a lot of nice isolation between uh, all the different, the various modules. Um, it's built with the DAP and app architecture kind of target in mind, uh, small and concise, uh, async only. Uh, and I try to fail as loudly as quickly as possible everywhere. Um, strong types as, as best as you can get JavaScript strong types. Although I do support some amorphic number handling. And um, I'm kind of looking to remove that um, as well. Community-driven design, so keeping the code clean and simple and being able to be upgraded uh, very easily. And as well, uh, trying to keep opinions off the table as best as possible and keep configurability really high across the whole stack. So a big feature um, and uh, kind of a big note is that uh, we use bn.js and not big number JS. And the pros of that are that it's absolute precision by default. So it doesn't support decimals and floats, which are potentially very dangerous, considering you know, that we're working with money and rounding is not necessarily <laughs> the greatest thing. Um, and uh, it's heavily used and interoperable by Ethereum.js and Ethers.js. Um, but the cons are that it's not necessarily interoperable with big number JS, um, uh, Web3. And um, sometimes it accepts invalid values, unprefixed hex, which is somewhat dangerous. But um, we kind of take care of that on, on another layer. So you don't really have to think about that. But it's just something to consider. Um, so signing providers and account generation. So um, just simple providers to kind of shove in um, signed transaction packets. Um, and uh, and kind of handle accounts, um, uh, we provide those too. And as for some of the dev tools that we offer, so this is a tool that I've been working on for quite some time. So it's a highly configurable, multi-stage, language agnostic contract deployment facility. So the idea here is, is that you have something similar to Webpack, where you have this single JavaScript module. It's a highly configured um, deployment stage module. Um, and basically, the idea is you take all these raw imports, like JSON files, contracts, um, you know, things that need to be plotted out. Um, you shove them through uh, loaders that you can define yourself, like Webpack. 
Um, and then you run them through a deployment module uh, that can basically take that data, it's formatted the way you want, and now you, d you run the deployment staging the way that you want it. Um, and then you kind of fire done at the end. Um, and then you can output your uh, data with simple output formatting plugins. Um, and the result is that you get this very complex deployment staging facility for contracts that you can kind of tuck into uh, Mocha, you can tuck into whatever testing facility you want. Um, and you can also define your environment really easily. So you're just putting in the raw provider object um, and uh, a name and your default transaction uh, objects. And then you're just going to run that deployment sequence. And the thing is, is there's a lot of tools out there like Truffle and everything, and, and they're getting better all the time. But th this was essentially what I wanted from the beginning, which is just a sequence tool that I could run complex deployments with and just do that in a very fluent way. Um, it is high configurability, which means there's a high, you know, setup overhead when you when you initially start using it. But basically, once once you get your deployment environment the way that you want it, with the loaders that you want, so Sol C and some environment loading and stuff, then you don't have to do anything. You can just reuse your same modules over and over again. Um, so. Uh, this is uh, one thing that's going to be moved into ETS. Uh, right now, it only has about 30% test coverage, so I, I need to get that around 100 before I move it into to ETS. So, but that's called ETH Deploy, and that's available um, on my GitHub, so silent Cicero, uh slash ETH Deploy. Um, so a bit of the roadmap. Um, so I'm going to move the ABI work uh, from ETS just over to Ethers.js because um, Richard Moore is literally the god you've never met yet and is amazing. Um, so he's in the room. He's in the room. Uh, <laughs> personal hero. Uh, so um, as well, the removal of buffer across the modules, um, which should reduce the non-account handling module to around 50 kilobytes. Um, and uh, as well, better account handling and filtering. So right now I have pretty good uh, uh, filtering and event handling, but I think I'd like to get that better. Uh, some people have complained about um, certain, certain aspects of that, so that'll get improved. Um, I really want to integrate um, some new bounties networks that are coming about. So bounties.network is very cool, and Gitcoin. Um, and, uh, and that's just for keeping the libraries updated and, and uh, keeping bugs um, you know, away. Uh, removing amorphic number handling. So basically right now we support multiple kinds of types going into number handling. I, I think uh, I'm just going to support probably just big numbers. Uh, and while that's a little bulkier and definitely not everyone's favorite, uh, sometimes I, I prefer that just because it keeps type strong. Um, and then as well, uh, more detailed error handling. Uh, so just, um, I'd like the errors, right now they are pretty detailed, but I'd like them to also be user friendly uh, for new users. Um, I think that's, that's pretty critical to new people entering the space. Um, and then Gitbook documentation. So right now all the documentation's in a, in a repo through readmes, so I'd like to move that to Gitbook. Um, and just uh, as well, so, because um, I have just a few minutes. Um, yeah, so there's definitely been a lot of discussion before I just thank all the people that <laughs> heavily influenced my thinking. Um, there's definitely a lot of discussion around uh, like alternatives um, to Web3. I think Web3 has been quite a journey. Um, I, I've been using Ethereum since Proof of Concept 5, so I've kind of sludged through the journey at every stage <laughs> when Ethereum barely worked and there was no tools to now it's fantastically working and there's so many tools but still a lot of you know room to grow um, I think uh, you know the architecture is growing significantly and we have um, a lot of really cool stuff um, coming up um, and uh, I, I think the the thing with alternatives and especially having kind of a di diverse set of tools um, at this layer is just you know this is like the front door to Ethereum and it's very critical that everything works properly that errors are thrown where they should be they throw loudly that you know early users to our technology um, can kind of get a great experience out of it because right now it's not a great experience and right now. We have a lot of um, you know, junior devs and stuff um, who are definitely melting when they start <laughs> using Ethereum uh, when they shouldn't be. It should be a very simple process. Um, and I think that uh, we kind of need to get more realistic with our expectations and what we want to achieve, especially when it comes to just like 
an effing RPC layer that has some data formatting <laughs> and some contract handling. Like, it drives me crazy. I'm like, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I think uh, if you see uh, potential to fix modules or to make them better or even to do your own, you should definitely do that. Um, you should definitely expand the ecosystem and, uh, and try to help out where you can on existing modules. Um, and you know, once again, like my my personal favorites definitely lie with with Ethers JS and and uh, the modules that I've been using. Um, and I actively develop apps, so I'm I'm currently developing um, Boardroom, which has been in stealth mode for like two and a half years. It's a super <laughs> old project. Um, and so I'm constantly using this tech that that I've been implementing, um, and that's kind of given me a, a completely different perspective on architecture. Um, but as well, I, I just like to be a little more old school with my thinking. So um, you know, the Unix philosophy and all that sort of stuff in mind uh, has kind of led me to to this sort of design. Um, so yeah, just a special thanks to a few people. So Richard Moore for doing Ethers JS, Web3 JS, and Fabian. Um, for you know manning the ship and like holy shit it's been just like a crazy ride and now there's like a bazillion people in the DevCon room <laughs> and not just like a hundred um, and uh, and Dan Finley from MetaMask and Pele um, and Martin Betsy and Vitalik for creating Ethereum which I always thank at the end I just think it's great you know uh, <laughs> and then uh, Joe and Consensus uh, for funding everything. This is my contact, um, and that's the link to EJS, and thank you. Thank you.